Bienvenue à la session scientifique du département de médecine familiale de l'Université d'Ottawa. La session se veut bilingue. Vous êtes invité à poser vos questions dans la langue de votre choix. Bonne session. Cette présentation sera enregistrée et est disponible sur la chaîne YouTube du département de médecine familiale. En poursuivant la session, vous consentez à être enregistré si votre caméra ou microphone est activé. This session is being recorded and will be posted on the Department of Family Medicine YouTube channel. By continuing the session, you are consenting to be recorded if your camera or microphone is activated. Nous sommes réunis aujourd'hui à partir de nombreux endroits différents et dans un espace virtuel. Mais nous désirons commencer par reconnaître les terres sur lesquelles se trouve le département de médecine familiale de l'Université d'Ottawa, qui font partie du territoire traditionnel non cédé du peuple Anishinaabe algonquin. Nous vous invitons à réfléchir à votre propre emplacement au Canada par rapport au territoire où vous vous trouvez aujourd'hui. Nous reconnaissons aussi les gardiens des savoirs traditionnels, jeunes et âgés. Nous honorons leurs courageux dirigeants d'hier, d'aujourd'hui et de demain. Akonongum egawi kad ki migwewaj. Nimanajianig kakina anishnabeg undaje kaye ugug kakina eneagizijig ene kukamikak kanadang eje udapinagig endawajin udawang. We are gathered today from many different locations and in a virtual space but we wish to begin by recognizing the land on which the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Ottawa is located, which is part of the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. We invite you to think about your own location in Canada in relation to the territory where you find yourself today. We also acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders past, present, and future. Bienvenue. Welcome and good morning, everyone. Great to see such a uh, wonderful turnout for the first Family Medicine Grand Rounds of the year. I like to think of September as the beginning of the year rather than uh, than January or another time as we're all back to school and um, hard to believe it's actually end of September already and next week's gonna be October. Um, for those of you who are new to uh, Grand Rounds, uh, they're from eight to nine, and um, we have two speakers uh, today. They'll each have about 20 minutes for their presentation and about 10 minutes for uh, questions and answers. Uh, my name's Doug Archibald. I'm the uh, Director of Research for the Department of Family Medicine, and it's my pleasure to, um, uh, to be the moderator of today's rounds. I'd also like to introduce uh, Xavier Toussaint, um, who is um, our Family Medicine Grand Rounds uh, coordinator. He's also um, a research associate with, uh, with the department uh, within the uh, research office. So um, thank you, uh, Xavier, for uh, getting us all together today. So that's, uh, that's fabulous. So um, let us begin. As I said, we have two speakers uh, today. The first speaker is uh, Dr. Sarah Simkin. And Dr. Simkin is a family practice anesthetist sorry, and health workforce work researcher. She is the health workforce planning theme co-lead for the Canadian Health Workforce Network. And she's been a leading primary care uh, planner in Toronto since 2017. Her approach to planning has been presented across Canada and internationally and we are going to uh, hear her present her work. I'm so pleased to be here with you today to share some of the health workforce research and leadership work that I do when I'm not working as a family practice anesthetist in Elmont. Today, I'm gonna to speak about innovations in workforce planning. I'd like to acknowledge that I work as part of a team with colleagues at the Canadian Health Workforce Network or CHU, Dr. Ivy Burjo, Henrietta Boateng, Renata Kalakova, amongst others, and with the health analytics team at Ontario Health Toronto, led by Cynthia Damba, who's joining us today. After the presentation, I'll share the slides with the Prime team, 
Uh, so if you're interested in accessing the resources or publications that I reference, you can get to them through the links in the presentation. You're probably not going to be surprised to hear me say that health systems around the world are experiencing unprecedented workforce challenges. Some are in crisis. We see it in the media on a regular basis, and I'm sure we all see evidence of it every day in our own practices. In view of this, I would like to highlight the planning imperative. If our health systems had an embedded culture of planning, we might not be in this position. If we had anticipated that an aging population with more complex care demands would coincide with an aging workforce, uh, approaching retirement, we could have adjusted our policies, our educational pipelines, and our incentives to maintain alignment between workforce capacity and population needs. With scenario analyses and high quality data, we might even have anticipated and been able to plan for a global pandemic. But we didn't do this, and now our health systems are in a bit of a mess. <laughs> The situation we find ourselves in could get even worse. And so the second best time to plan is now. Proactive rather than reactive health workforce planning is needed to anticipate and mitigate future health workforce crises. Health leaders recognize this. And in 2017, Ontario Health Toronto approached the Canadian Health Workforce Network for help with planning for equitable distribution of primary care workforce resources. Using a participatory action research framework, Tune and Ontario Health Toronto have co-developed an approach to planning that leverages international leading practices and features a number of innovations. As health system transformation moves decision-making closer to where care is provided, there's tremendous appetite for tools to support planning at a local level. So what sort of innovations are we talking about? Today, I'm gonna to tell you about some of the outputs of our primary care planning toolkit and our engagement and capacity building and spread and scale activities. The innovative toolkit that we've developed builds a body of evidence around the current and projected future states of population health needs and primary care service provision at a neighborhood level. It also provides a variety of resources and supports for planning, including a fit for purpose planning process, a how-to playbook, a quantitative planning model and integrated data repository, and an interactive dashboard. In our planning process, we prioritize engagement and capacity building, generating customized data and tools for local decision makers, intentionally building capacity with a series of formal engagements, and undertaking developmental evaluation of our engagement activities. We're also committed to spread and scale. We've been talking to health leaders in other regions and provinces and have applied for funding to expand and adapt the planning approach to Kingston, Edmonton, and Montreal. The next phase of work will formalize tools for integrating stakeholder engagement and operationalize allocation modeling so that we can understand and optimize the care available to patients from a range of primary care providers. Our fit for purpose planning process emerged from extensive review and synthesis of planning models and in-depth consultations with Ontario Health Toronto. The planning approach involves iterative cycles of horizon scanning, scenario generation, and workforce analysis, which inform policy analysis and decision-making. A set of environmental scanning tools supports horizon scanning, and a quantitative planning model, data repository, and interactive dashboard support workforce analysis. Engagement with stakeholders is embedded in each step of the process. Even though the planning process was originally designed for primary care in Toronto, it turns out that it's applicable to planning for a variety of sectors and specialties and regions. Our how-to playbook is another innovation that emerged from engagement and is now embedded in the toolkit. It makes planning accessible by providing generalized guidance for users in a range of settings with a range of planning experience. It highlights leading practices and provides curated resources supplemented with tips and case study examples. The playbook could equally be considered a capacity building intervention. Quantitative planning model and integrated data repository are the behind the scenes workhorses of planning. These innovations facilitate workforce analysis by synthesizing relevant information about population health, 
and the primary care workforce in a series of modules. These modules, which ranged from population health profiles through workforce profiles to alignment, both stand alone and interact with one another. Data from numerous sources come together in these modules and in the model to help us understand the workforce landscape. Recognizing that large spreadsheets aren't very accessible to the average person, we've developed an interactive dashboard that is underpinned by the modular model and data that you saw in the previous slide. The dashboard is an interactive Power BI tool that presents the information in an accessible way, guiding users through a stepwise planning process, understanding community characteristics, understanding service requirements, understanding workforce service capacity, assessing alignment, exploring the factors at play and putting it all together. Users can walk through each of the six steps sequentially for a given neighborhood or choose to focus on a single step across multiple neighborhoods. The dashboard includes narrative interpretations of the data and questions to consider at each step. And it supports identification of priorities and evaluation of primary care initiatives. And I'm gonna walk you through the six steps, an example neighborhood for, for these six steps. In step one, we assemble data related to population size, age structure, health status, marginalization, health services utilization, primary care attachment, and other relevant community characteristics. We can compare neighborhood indicators with city benchmarks. The panel on the right offers a narrative summary. So in this neighborhood, which is in the far northwest corner of the city, we see that it's a large neighborhood with a degree of marginalization related to a racialized and newcomer population, an above average burden of hypertension, diabetes, and chronic disease, and 80% attachment to primary care. With that as a baseline, we can move forward into step two, where we look at service requirements. We look at requirements for primary care, estimated in physician visits, and broken down into the services required for residents of the neighborhood, for residents of other neighborhoods, and for patients from outside the city. We can see that in this neighborhood, patients access about 30% of their primary care in their home neighborhood. We can also see that about half of the primary care in this neighborhood is accessed by patients from outside Toronto. That's those red bars in the chart. This makes sense because this neighborhood is an edge neighborhood. So there's a lot of flow expected between the city and the surrounding region. In more central neighborhoods, the visits for outside Toronto patients are typically quite a bit less. So now that we've seen community characteristics and service requirements, we can move on to service capacity. In step three, we look at the characteristics and capacity of the primary care workforce, including physicians and interprofessional health practitioners. We focus on physician service capacity in the form of primary care visits, and we flag service capacity that's at risk due to physician retirement. So in this neighborhood, we see that there are lots of physicians and that a quarter of all primary care visits, physician visits are at risk due to retirement. That those are the orange bars in the chart. We can also see that there's no midwifery or psychology capacity in this neighborhood. Next, we move on to alignment where we put service requirements and service capacity together. In step four, we look at service requirements, service capacity, the alignment between the two, and the gap and how it's expected to change over time. This can inform decision-making and resource allocation. So in this neighborhood, we see that service requirements are expected to grow over time, while service capacity is expected to shrink resulting in a primary care deficit that becomes more and more pronounced with time. In step five, we can take a deeper dive into issues that impact the neighborhood's needs, capacity, and gap. In Toronto, growth, mobility, and physician retirement are all important factors at play in the primary care landscape. And this step allows for a focused examination of each, a deeper dive, if you like. Then we come back to step six and put it all together. We compile all the relevant indicators to build a picture of the primary care landscape. We try to identify the issues and their drivers so that we can start to explore solutions. In this neighborhood, we know that the gap, which is significant and expected to grow, 
is not being driven by population growth. To find out what is driving the gap, we can look closely at other indicators and also supplement the toolkit with additional local knowledge. And then we can start to explore population level, workforce level, and system level solutions. In the course of the most recent phase of planning, we engaged with five local Ontario health teams. We provided a workforce planning 101 workshop and one-on-one -on -one sessions with each OHT to review customized data packages. We also brought everyone together in a final network of planner session at which health system leaders from across the country realized that they're all facing similar challenges and that they can work together to support one another and share ideas and solutions. The approach helped providers, planners, and stakeholders understand more about the patients they're serving, where they come from, and their primary care needs to identify current and emerging trends, and to explore strategies to improve and transform care. We studied the engagement component of our planning approach using developmental evaluation, and our findings have recently been published in healthcare management forums. Overall, engagement was very well received, with stakeholders saying things like, I don't think there's any OHT who thinks that health workforce capacity planning is optional, and there's no way we could do this ourselves. Here's a short video clip that captures some of what our partners are saying about the toolkit. The whole video can be found on the Tune website. What I want people to know about this data toolkit is the level of detail that it provides. It tells you who lives in these neighborhoods, how many providers are in them, uh, what allied health is available. It also shows you projections of what these neighborhoods are going to look like three years from now, five years from now. I would urge all OHDs to use this toolkit in an iterative fashion so that moving forward, they can get up-to-date information about the populations they serve so that they can provide the care that those populations need. This is really helpful information uh, when we're making decisions about how to create equitable distribution of health human resources. In our view, planning should be accessible to everyone. Currently, decision makers in Toronto are benefiting from the vision and foresight of the health system leaders who invested in this work starting in 2017. But we can spread and scale these innovations to address the planning imperative more broadly. We're in the process of expanding and adapting our approach for Kingston, Edmonton, and Montreal. As we do this, we'll be developing and integrating formal tools for stakeholder engagement into the planning process. The other thing we'll be doing is developing an allocation methodology that will allow us to model team-based care using population and service segmentation. As we move forward with spreading and scaling, we know that important facilitators of planning include partnerships, accessible planning tools, capacity building, and consultation and engagement at every stage. Focusing on these enablers will help to ensure that spread and scale is successful. I'll leave you with three take-home messages. First, Workforce planning is a critical component of equitable, sustainable, and efficient health systems. Second, innovations in planning, like the ones we've reviewed today, have potential to improve our health systems and are welcomed by system leaders. And third, investment is needed to create a culture of planning. I encourage you to think about where workforce planning might fit into your corner of the health system and about what you might need to be able to plan. Here's a list of the articles we published about this work and the toolkit dashboard and video will be available through this link. Sarah, thank you so much. That was a fabulous presentation. Um, we have about 10 minutes for, for questions. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll sort of kick things off. I just had a, a, a question about step two, two in the toolkit where you had identified the percentage of uh, care at home, in the home neighborhood, and it was only 2021 data. Was that just a, um, an issue of availability, data availability, or is there another reason? Yeah, so what you see here uh, has, we're just in the process of an update that okay. hopefully will launch next week, and that will be more recent data, um, but, which is the specific answer to question, but the more general answer is that getting data to support this work is a huge challenge, and getting timely data is even harder, yeah. so... Um, it just takes a really long time for data to be collected and cleaned and posted and then fed back into work that we do in order to support decision making. It's, it's 
abs it's actually shocking how long it takes and how difficult it is and how expensive it is <clears throat> to bring to make something like this happen um, using high quality data. We've done the best we can, but there's a long way to go. Yeah. Thank you. Claire, go ahead. Hi, Sarah. Fantastic presentation. I just like can't wait to dive in and I use <laughs> probably all the question time. Uh, my name is Claire Kendall. I'm one of the researchers in the department and uh, I've had the privilege of working with the Ottawa Neighborhood Study who has um, a lot of the data actually that you're presenting and sometimes even more except the health workforce piece. And I see Cynthia Damba on the call. I know we had a call a meeting with her last week and their team. Uh, to see if we can partner, like if you would feel able to add Ottawa to the list of partnerships for scale and spread, we are ready to do this work. We have a lot of the data. We're getting the HSPN data. We already get the OCHPP data, so um, as well as a whole bunch of other social determinant and regional health data. So I think it would be a fantastic partnership if we could bring, and we're working closely with our OHTs as well, who are asking for, hey, Cynthia, asking for um, this data as well. Great. I mean, we all know that this is work that needs to be done. And so um, it's great that Ottawa is working at a neighborhood level and that you have um, a good body of evidence already to, to, to start with. Maybe I'll just, um, because Cynthia's here, she's our Ontario, the Director of Health Analytics at Ontario Health Toronto. <clears throat> and she's been intimately involved in this, pro in this project from the very beginning. Maybe I'll um, just open uh, a hand over to Cynthia to comment a little bit on um, what expanding this approach uh, to Ottawa might look like. Uh, thanks. thanks. To be fair, uh, Cynthia's already made good connections for us. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Sarah. And, and uh, hi, Claire and everyone. Yeah, it, it's great to be collaborating with Ottawa. And, and we had a meeting like um, with uh, Claire and uh, the o Ottawa team uh, last week, I think, or this week. Uh, and what we are doing is we actually have looped in, um, not on, uh, we, we want to loop in the East region, um, uh, the, the East region uh, decision support and uh, uh, teams so that we all work together uh, and, and standardize things rather than uh, keeping things separate, but also including uh, the provincial uh, primary care group also. Dr. Liz Maga and uh, her team are all looked in. So uh, it will be good um, to encourage the spread and scale of our process to Ottawa. Hello, Sarah. Uh, we've met virtually. My name is Bill Hogg. Um, and it's nice to meet you almost in person. Uh, congratulations on this uh, very excellent and important work. I have just a few questions to ask. Um, my objective is to try to understand a bit better the methodology you use. So uh, I have four questions for you quickly. Uh, do you attempt to figure out whether the providers are in comprehensive practice versus focused practice? Do you adjust for full-time versus part-time providers? Do you include nurse practitioners uh, in your mix? And do you adjust at all for the um, sex of the provider, um, understanding that uh, uh, women have usually smaller panel sizes and retire earlier? Yeah, thanks so much, Bill. Those are all great questions and I'll just take them one, two, three, four. Um, so the first question was about, um, do we uh, differentiate between comprehensive providers in comprehensive primary care and those in focused practice? And the answer is yes, we do. So what we uh, did was we started by focusing on those in comprehensive primary care. And what we realized is that when we started doing the alignment between service requirements and service capacity, um, it just didn't, and, and we <clears throat> looked at everything that didn't match up. And so what we do is we look at service capacity from comprehensive primary care physicians, 
service capacity from physicians who are considered to be non-comprehensive. And we think that's lots of walk-in clinic um, type work. And, um, and we look to, at those together as the full total service capacity in the neighborhood. So that's the answer to your first question. Um, the second question and, and the fourth question I'm gonna to answer together and those were about, do we adjust for full-time, part-time, and do we consider the sex of the provider? And the answer is yes, in the sense that we actually start with individual level estimates of service capacity. So we look at how many visits these providers actually delivered. And, and so that, it, and then we aggregate those to the neighborhood level. And then we look out into the future and we adjust for average age-related changes in workload. And so sometimes, you know, if your if your group of providers is young, then as they as they move into their mid-career phase, their workload actually expands. And so we see service capacity go up. If your group of providers is more elderly, then as they age, they tend to, their workloads tend to drop off. And so we see service capacity decrease over time in those in neighborhoods with an older group of physicians. And the last question is about nurse practitioners. And so at the moment, what we have for nurse practitioners is their um, available work hours from the health professions database. Um, they're not currently integrated into our modeling, but that is the next step. So our allocation methodology that we're working on will look at not just nurse practitioners, but a full suite of providers who are delivering bundles of primary care service and looking at what kind of services groups, population groups need and how those can be bundled together in different team configurations to optimize the match between needs and the workforce. Fabulous, thank you. We'll move to our uh, our to our uh, next presentation. Sarah, thank you very much. Um, perhaps even if you want to put your uh, email in the uh, in the comment section, if people have any follow up questions, uh, uh, that would be great. Cynthia, likewise. So um, thank you very much. Um, our next uh, um, speaker is uh, Abhish Joshi, um, who holds a master's degree uh, in computer science with a concentration in applied artificial intelligence uh, from the University of Ottawa. Um, he has over two years experience and has de dedicated time to solving healthcare and education problems using AI um, and making some great strides in this area. And I know, Abhish, you're recently back from a, um, a medical education conference. So uh, looking forward to hearing your presentation. So floor over to you. So hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Avisht. And topic for today's presentation is the early identification of family medicine residents at risk of failure using explainable AI and natural language processing. Uh, this research is conducted by Department of Family Medicine at the University of Ottawa. Uh, the abstract for this research was accepted at AMI 2024 in Switzerland, Basel. And uh, the research is uh, the research paper is submitted at J Journal of Graduate Medical Education for and is under review. Uh, moving on to the disclosure statement, uh, we do not have any conflict of interest to declare. Uh, so in this presentation, firstly, I'll start start with the background of the project, the objectives that we had, uh, the data set that we used to follow the experiment, the methodology that we followed, the results. And how did we make use of explainable AI? And what are the limitation and future work for the research? And finally, I'll end it with conclusion. So residency, let's understand the background first. Residency programs are rigorous and demanding. Each resident during their residency receives a continuous feedback based on their performance. However, not all excel. Now task here is to identify those residents this timely and provide them the necessary support. 
For this task, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and explainable AI would help us automate the process for early identification. Now let's understand the objective of the project. So there are two fold objective. First is the business objective. The main objective here is to improve medical education. And that can be done using leveraging artificial intelligence and explainable AI. Also, this tool will act as a screening layer and help us for identifying, help human expert for identifying the uh, residents who could be at risk. And it's not there to replace them, it's just to assist them. Also, it will help us uh, address the gaps in the residents' competencies. Moving on to the engineering objectives. Here, we what, what we want to do is to predict the odds of failure in the certification exam by leveraging machine learning experimentation. Also, we want to integrate explainable AI to generate actionable insights and patterns so that the decisions that are transparent and understandable to human. Now let's understand the data set that we used. Uh, the data set is based on family medicine ITERs for postgraduate year one from 2018 to 2022. The data were de-identified and this research is an ethics ex exempt. So Canadian family medicine certification exams has two components. One is SU and one is SAM. SU stands for simulated office oral and SAM is short answer management problem and they both make up Canadian family medicine certification exam. Now let's dive deeper into the data set. So we had total of 1,382 points of which 61 failed in SU, 21 failed in SAM, eight failed in both and 1,292 passed the certification exam. As you can clearly see, the data set is quite imbalanced and AI model have tendency to be biased towards the class that is major in majority. So this is the challenge that we had to face, uh, which we will discuss in the methodology. So moving on to the methodology, we wanted to explore how each data, data type affects the model performance. So we have two types of data, qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative data basically means textual data, which includes feedback and comments provided by the supervisor to each resident. The quantitative data or tabular data includes values that can be quantified to each resident. For example, how many days was the resident absent? It, it would be a number. And third, num uh, third data was generated by combining both qualitative and quantitative data. And for, for this data, we wanted the main objective here was we wanted to increase the information richness in the data so that we can use both qualitative and quantitative data and combine them and then predict using AI model. Also, we wanted to apply deep learning and language model using explainable AI. And the target variable here was to predict whether the resident would fail or pass in certification exam based on the data provided. This is a pictorial representation of the methodology that we follow. Uh, so we had, again, reiterating, we have three types of data. One is qualitative. Uh, the series of experiment one involves qualitative data, which is focused on textual data and the feedback. We used ExcelNet, which is a language model, a deep learning model. And moving on, the thing here is AI model does not understand text. It only understands numbers. So we need some techniques to convert text into numerical value. For this, Two, there are two types of techniques. One is vectorization and one is embedding. So or what, what vectorization do is it converts text into numerical value, but it does not have the meaning associated to it. Whereas embeddings have meaning associated when it converts text to numerical value. So for this, we use TFIDF for vectorization and Doc2Vec for text embedding. And then we applied the AI models. Moving on to experiment series of experiment two that uses quantitative data. Uh, as you saw earlier that the data set is imbalanced. So for this, we use a data balancing technique, SMOT, which populates the uh, points which are less in quantity. After which we did feature scaling and then applied the AI models. For experiment three, we use multimodal data uh, by combining both qualitative and quantitative data. Again, qualitative data is difficult to 
convert. That's why it becomes a bit challenging uh, to adjust accordingly so that it can be concatenated with the quantitative data. After text processing, we combined the data, apply its mode so that it's the data is balanced, and then we applied the artificial intelligence models. So moving on to results, uh, we saw that uh, from experiment three that uses both the uh, qualitative and quantitative data, multimodality achieved an accuracy of 89% of detect for detecting medical residents could be at risk. And an F1 score, which is a metric that balances both precision and recall uh, of score of 74.54. Now for experiment one, ExcelNet was the champion model with an accuracy of 72%. For experiment two, the accuracy was for SPM was 81.71%. For experiment three, that was the highlight of the research, achieved an accuracy of 89% and with an overall improvement of 7.34% compared to the result that were achieved by quantitative data. Now, uh, moving on to explainable AI. Now, what AI model acts as is like a black, black box model. What we input and we get the output, but we don't know what is going on behind the model. For this task, we applied explainable AI so that we are able to understand what exactly is going on behind the model. What were the key features that influenced the prediction? For this, SHAP, we applied two techniques, SHAP and word topic. SHAP, uh, gives summary chart which lists important features according to their importance to the AI model. For example, the col columns were renamed so that uh, the, we had a huge a long, long amount of column names. So we renamed it. So for example, PC0 is the most important feature according to the AI model, followed by PC1 and PC3 uh, and so on. So what uh, for for example, the PC0 is the most important feature. So what is it exactly? So the PC1 uh, is the where the rotation objective discussed with the resident. So it is hypothesized that uh, residents who have to discuss their objectives are already struggling, thus higher failure rate of 7.2%. With the staff will basically help faculty to guide on the areas where the residents could be at risk. The another technique that we applied is BERT topic, which is a advanced topic modeling technique that uses language model like chat GPT. Uh, it generates topic accordingly. Uh, for example, topic one is related to trajectory of the resident. Topic two is related to communication and uh, communication centered skills with patients. Third is timely note taking and documentation. Uh, so, Key finding here are that uh, we wanted to see is there any correlation with the topic related topic with the uh, final status of the resident whether pass or fail. So what we observed that positive feedbacks and timely note taking are linked to certification, uh, certification success. However, exceptions do exist, but trends are clear. Moving on to the limitation and future work. Uh, we had a small amount of data that is 1,382. And uh, AI model likes medical terminologies because it does not understand, it un only understand numbers. So for future tasks, what we are planning to do to use AI models that are specifically designed to work on medical data and are trained on PubMed abstracts. Also, we wanted to implement domain specific language modeling and uh, data augmentation technique like GraphRef. So in conclusion, I would say multimodality helped us improve classification result and it demonstrates the feasibility of AI system for early identification and highlights the benefit of merging both types of data, increasing the information richness. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Abist. Um Great presentation. Um, I do, um, I'll, I'll just start the questions if you don't mind. Sure. And it, um, I'd like to actually hear if you had any feedback when you did present uh, at Amy um, in, in Basel um, with regards to the methodology. Um, you're probably presenting amongst many who are venturing into very similar waters of using AI um, for 
examination purposes, et cetera. And I was just wondering if you had any comments about slide 10 in particular, the um, where you laid out the methodology and whether people were found that confirmatory or not. Sure. So uh, the questions that I, or comments that I received during the presentation was were mostly regarding the type of data that was used. Uh, initially, uh, the comments or feedback, uh, they were expecting it to be an audio, but it was actually a test, so text data. Uh, so I conveyed that uh, the data that we are using is textual and not uh, audio, but uh, even if it would have been audio, it would have been translated or transcribed into from audio to text. So that's one of the thing. Also, uh, they wanted to know uh, like how, again, how did we combine the data? So then I explained using vectorization and embedding, you can convert text to numbers. And then because again, AI model only understand numbers. So that's how uh, I was able to express the, what exactly we did in the presentation in the like in the research great thank you denise well good morning everyone that was a wonderful presentation i guess i have a question you sort of mentioned that uh, you may need to use different models and to train the models with medical language what do you have to do with the evaluators of residents do they need to be trained differently so that they're producing data that is more easily used by these ai models uh, um... Yeah, like it could be if we have certain questions designed accordingly so that the evaluator can grade them at uh, each resident accordingly. Uh, but for for now, that's not the case. Uh, the, uh, the, there is already a format that uh, DFM follows. So like <laughs> that's the one I'd say, but not like, maybe in future, but particularly not right now. Uh, uh, Actually, the thing is uh, that uh, it's like a chat GPT model, uh, the, the one that I was talking about, it, that is trained on medical data. So it, it doesn't require any particular format. Uh, we can change or we can manage the data accordingly as per our needs. And then, but the thing is, we just need to take a keep a common format for everyone. So that's the main highlight here. Good morning. Um, can you guys hear me? Just fine. Oh, yes. Okay. Abish, I, uh, first of all, thank you. You know, sometimes these explanations of how AI is working are very confusing, but I found yours. I could follow how you took the text and translated it to numbers. So thank you. That was very clear. Uh, my question is, um, as a teacher, we've seen a lot of residents in the past, um, you mentioned a few points, but I'm really curious to know if you can mention a few things that you noticed as flags early on. I, I know you mentioned timely note taking and positive communication feedback meant that they passed their exams. But uh, so I'm guessing that if they didn't have good, good communication skills and they didn't fill out their notes, that wasn't good. But any other things that came out of your study as early flags for residents? I would say uh, uh, the topic six, that is immunization. So these are the procedures uh, for that for, that are followed uh, as far as I know. So residents who have shown better uh, scheduling of the vaccines and time management as well are supposed to be, are, are expected to perfor perform better. Uh, also a person who is a team player is linked to kind of uh, performing better and better chances of clearing the certification exam. So Great. these are few few more topics uh, that uh, are linked to success of resident in medical residency. Um, I've got another question, uh, Abish. I mean, of course, this was on the ITERS, which is just one of the many tools that we have for assessment. Is there any thought on um, incorporating um, other measures uh, that we may be using uh, for assessment? Uh, for now, as far as I uh, know, uh, only ITERs are considered for now, but uh, there is planning to be another project in which uh, the residents who are struggling will be assigned a coursework, uh, like the courses that need to be done based on their requirement. So each resident 
have some weakness and have some strength so according to the their weakness they would be assigned a new strength a new course so that they could strengthen that part of their residency oh just a comment you know i was thinking about this and i could see how eventually maybe you can extrapolate you know the, the findings of this to resident selection so we're not even talking about identifying residents in difficulty we're sort of screening them before they even get into the program but that's a long way away i think there, there has been some preliminary work done on this um, in, um, uh, I'll, I'll send you the paper, uh, Denise. Um, this was now a year ago, actually a year ago, uh, summer. So um, I'll, I'll flip it to you. I'm sorry, I can't get, I can't get my virtual hand up. I don't know. <laughs> it's okay. um, I saw your real one. <laughs> Um, Abish, thanks. That's that was very, very interesting. Thanks. Thanks so much for that presentation. I, I just have it's more of a philosophical question that I have with AI and assessment, particularly in family medicine. Um, because certainly it's being used a lot. Um, I can see and I, I have, I should also mention I work at the college, the CFPC part time as a clinician educator, and I'm involved particularly with the SUE exam, the simulated office oral. So that, that exam um, tests or assesses consultation skills, communication skills. And there has been a lot of research into how doctors think about what they do, family experienced family doctors, and, and whether you can use AI to almost quote, replace the doctor um, because um, experienced family doctors don't necessarily follow guidelines and uh, algorithmic thinking, which, which essentially, in my from my understanding, AI is 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 sort of you know based on that. I was just wondering what your thoughts were about because communication skills, in particular, and patient centered behaviors, is something that I always have difficulty being able to work out how AI can actually accurately be applied. I was just wondering what your thoughts were. Sure. Uh, so like, uh, I, like I recently went for the conference in Switzerland. Uh, so there, this was one of the topic that was discussed uh, for AI in medicine, uh, medical education particularly. So uh, what they did was uh, they wanted to see can AI model replace uh, third, like the residents, the MD, doctors who are who have put in their huge amount of years study so the studies were inconclusive uh the some of the sometimes ai model was performing better sometimes the medical uh, doctors were performing better so in particularly there is a lot of scope of improvement i would say in ai uh, and uh, and it's also depend on the person because uh, i would not want myself to be judged by AI for if it involves health in particular. So there is a factor of trust that the humans have towards each other. So I think that is one of the things. And uh, for uh, as most of, as, as you said, like a senior doctor have a tendency, might have tendency to not fulfill, like the not write down criteria accordingly so for that uh, ai could be used as a tool for example uh, using voice assistance uh, let's say doc uh, there is a there is a conversation between doctor and uh, patient and doctor advised few medicines and everything so what ai model could do is assign a specific format accordingly between by listening to the conversation between patient and doctor and then uh, type it down and then store it as a CSV or like the uh, like Excel file. So that is one of the area that I think AI could be very beneficial so that every uh, patient would have uh, a similar um, like um, feedback or I don't know what the term in here would be, but like everyone has the same format for their diagnosis. Great, thank you. Thanks. Jeff, go ahead. I think just to kind of, you know, follow up on Alan's sort of line of thinking and, you know, there's a lot of questions about, you know, the use of AI 
and you know what it, its impacts would be on uh, the medical community. And I think you know we've got to look at turning or changing the dialogue to not one of fear or one of you know replacing doctors, uh, but one of more complementing. Uh, and actually, it was a great article uh, in Forbes magazine from Bernard Marr that talks about how, you know, the partnership or the collaboration of human and machine actually can make you uh, more human uh, because you take the transactional piece away of the day to day transactional piece, allowing you to focus more on the human aspect. And so when you think of that in the case or of medicine. You know, instead of you being there typing away and staring at your keyboard to make sure you don't make a spelling mistake while your patient is telling you why or he or she is there, you're actually using natural language processing uh, and an AI scribe to <coughs> update or take your notes while you're looking that patient in the eye and actually being more human and being more empathetic and staring that patient in the eye and better understanding what's going on. And then maybe down the road, you do have that... Uh, basically that recommender system that is either corroborating uh, or providing an alternate course of action to you. But at the end of the day, the decision is still yours as the doctor on what course of treatment you have. But it's also, it could be providing you that second opinion that, you know, oh, you don't like my opinion? I'll, I'll, I could refer you to somebody else. And in six months, you might get a phone call to schedule that second opinion. Now you might get an immediate one. So um, so it's, I think there's a lot to be uh, spoken about. There's still the whole ethical component, but I think there's a lot of benefits to how AI can be leveraged and used in medicine. I know. Yeah, it's absolutely like, uh, to, uh, I I think, I don't think that AI would be ever able to replace, replace the doctors. So I think it's always there to complement it. It would make the work easy for the doctor, but not like replace it. So. That's I would that's like I would say that. I would like to uh, thank uh, both Abhish for his presentation and also uh, Sarah uh, for your uh, presentation as well. Um, two great uh, talks to uh, kick off the year. Um, I just like to say that we have um, rounds next month, um, October twenty fourth. Um, and we have um, uh, two student presentations. Um, their supervisors are uh, Dr. Jew and uh, Dr. Kendall, um, and they'll be presenting uh, uh, their uh, summer project work. So I uh, hope to see you all then. Um, and a reminder too that um, uh, this is an accredited program. So um, if you can uh, fill out uh, evaluations, uh, I'm sure they'll get posted uh, in the chat in just a minute. Um, that would be uh, fabulous. And um, with that, I can see Xavier's just put that in the uh, in the chat, so you can just click on it. That would be great. And with that, um, I will wish you a very good uh, Thursday and hope to see you on the 24th.